Perfect. Next question is, uh, how can these strategies be applied in manufacturing environments? Uh, well, a number of my clients are manufacturing are in manufacturing. So what you want to do in manufacturing environments is send your office workers to work from home. So that's definitely internal. And then you work in shifts. So what you want to do is work socially distanced in shifts for manufacturing. And that's something that you want to be thinking about. In the longer term, what you can do is move as much to robotics as possible. Right now, the co the costs have not justified some people moving to moving as much to robotics as they sh they ideally can but given that it's going to be pretty costly for you to keep teams working in the office i'm sorry in the manufacturing space at socially distanced with all the infection cleaning and of course legal liability you want to invest more into robotics going forward so right now working in shifts longer term investing into robotics that's kind of in turn and of course sending your team from the office to working at home that's stuff that i would talk about in terms of combination of internal work how you can do this and all the stuff from internal teams applies of course so on the on your office workers for external service delivery there's a lot of the stuff applies anyway you want to be able to do virtual distance collaboration with vendors investors clients prospects and so on so this is how i'm working with my clients who are manufacturing clients to address this issue and i think you can do the same thing with your clients and uh, your leaders who you're working with. Excellent, thank you. Next question is, if your business is engaged hospitality, say restaurants and hotels, uh, these are not virtual businesses. Yes. Uh, is there any advice? Uh, so we are out of business and jobs. Yeah, this is hard. I've just helped one of my clients who was the COO of a 24 chain uh, restaurant, mid diner chain in the Midwest transition and you know to being in the grocery store business became the regional manager of a series of grocery stores she got out of that business i this is not a good business to be in this is not this is going this is a business that's going to be the loser and i think that this is if you can to the extent that you can transitioning out of that business is going to be the best advice i can give you because it's going to be really really bad much worse than people who are optimistic and hopeful in those businesses are anticipating. Thank you. Our next question is, uh, please expand on what you mean by continuing liability issues and why these would be problematic in a return to office scenarios. Of course. So if somebody in, comes into the office and gets sick with COVID-19 and then their lawyer comes and then you know dies or gets seriously sick or something like that but let's assume dies obviously that's the bad scenario and then their family comes after you and says because of the inadequate social distancing standards uh, in the office you have caused this person to die and you are negligently liable for it that's the one obvious scenario. Then the same thing can, that's with the internal team, same thing can happen with your customers, clients who come to your office and who would say something, you know, if you didn't have an adequate safety guidelines, not everyone was wearing a mask, not everyone was following all the CDC guidelines. And if you actually look at the CDC guidelines, they're really hard to follow, really strict, really hard to follow. So there will be a lot of ways that lawyers who will be looking for business after losing a lot of business will be able to make people liable this is a very serious legal risk so this is one of the bigger one of the big reasons i'm strongly advising my clients and as many people as possible to get out of the office and stay out don't yo-yo back and forth when there's loosening of restrictions going back to the office and then coming back first of all creates instability this is a big problem and you want to create stability and routines for people that's how things will work effectively but also liabilities are going to be a serious issue when somebody dies and then their family comes after you thank you uh, so the next question uh, are the slides alone going to be available after the presentation no, the slides are for coming from Prezi. So Prezi is not a typical power. It's some kind of a typical PowerPoint slide. So those slides, I can't make them available, unfortunately. If you do have Prezi and uh, just fill out the tinyurl.com slash de dash event, I'll be happy to share the Prezi presentation with you as well. So just let me know. Excellent. Thank you. Next question is, if we suppress flatten the curve now, 
uh, this doesn't seem sustainable. How will the economy really survive if customers would not access most retail companies? So what is what has been shown successful in other countries that have done suppression is that when they did early suppression, then they had a much smaller outbreak. So then they can do contact tracing and isolation much more effectively. And that is where you figure out who is sick after you have loosenings of restrictions and then you contact all the people who have who they interacted with and get them to self quarantine. So that's what a successful initial suppression strategy has led to, because then there's loosening, then there's contact tracing isolation, and only in small areas, small regions have there been outbreaks. So for example, you might be reading about Singapore, and then they have the only areas where they are having serious outbreaks is in workers barracks for migrant workers. But the rest of Singapore, I mean, it's bad, but it's not nearly as bad as having all of Singapore having outbreaks as is happening in New York City, right? So that so a successful suppression strategy would look like having initial suppression to such an extent that you can suppress cases that no new cases are appearing. And then as new case, as you open up restrictions, you can do isolation and contact tracing. So as new cases appear, you can isolate the person with a case of COVID-19 as a result of extensive testing and then trace their contacts and isolate them who have, not isolate, but get them to self-quarantine. And then if in small region, let's say there's an outbreak in a certain city, then you can have just that city as opposed to the whole state have a stay at home order for a certain period of time. So that's ideally how a regime of of isolation shutdowns would happen in a way that doesn't break the economy. And that's the ideal scenario. Now, I'm not confident about the competence of many politicians in the US being able to bring about this scenario. So, you know, there's a lot of people piling on uh, the Georgia governor camp for uh, opening up barbershops, and I'm going to pile up on him as well. This is a very, very dumb move, very not helpful. It's going to result, again, criticized widely by Republicans and Democrats alike, because it's going to result in many more infections that you can't trace spiking cases and then georgia will have to close for a much longer time because there will be many more COVID 19 cases than there should have been otherwise so this is the, that, that's what you shouldn't be doing you should be doing the contact tracing isolation after bringing cases down Excellent. next question uh, this is incredibly informative and eye-opening uh, when this becomes Thank available you. for viewing after the live presentation is complete is this something i can share with my colleagues who are not uh, members of RIMS, or is this only for Eyes of RIMS members? Justin? Um, you can send that question privately. We'll, we'll work with you on an answer for that. Okay, great. And uh, if, you fill, if you fill out the tinyurl.com slash the event, I will, uh, we'll, we can talk about that uh, as well. So just keep that in mind. And I'll talk to Justin about this uh, to make sure that we have a clear answer. Thank you for asking that. Okay. Excellent. Um, next question is, uh, I am wondering about examples of unknown unknowns. Mm. I'm glad to you asked. So for example, right now, the, in uh, Africa, in uh, specifically the Horn of Africa, East Africa, Kenya, Ethiopia, Somalia, there's, I don't know if you heard about this, but there's a plague of locusts. Yes, it's a biblical issue. <laughs> so there's an increasingly large plague of locusts growing there. And ordinarily, when there's when the locusts are happening, so these are grasshop, these are types of grasshoppers that swarm and eat a lot of the crops. Ordinarily, when that happens, then uh, farmers, well, external agents from the W from a number of organizations, World Bank and so on, are able to come in and provide support and help for them to suppress them with anti uh, pest. Uh, with pesticide of various sorts, as well as some local experts who are already in the countries are able to come out with pesticide and address that. Now, due to travel restrictions associated with COVID-19, and that's one, uh, there's much less ability to do so. All the borders are closed, right? You can't have external people coming in and internal people, they're, they're restricted from traveling. So people from the cities who are the experts who have, who know how to control these outbreaks, they're not able to come to the farms to control the outbreak. And 
the Western governments, which would ordinarily provide expertise, aid, and so on, they are really busy with co controlling COVID-19 at home, so they don't have extra money for and extra resources to send people into that area. And what would what will happen then? Well, what will happen is that these swarms will grow larger and they will expand out from Ethiopia, Somalia, and so on, and go over the whole of Africa. And this is a very serious problem. It will cause biblical famines. This biblical, the biblical issue, biblical plague will cause biblical famines all because of COVID-19. So this is a combination on an unexpected event that grows and becomes a major disaster because of the indirect consequences of COVID-19. So this is just an example. So this is, if so, if your supply chains are dependent on Africa, on a number of, you want to be careful and thinking about the kind of civil unrest, food riots that will happen there. You already have a lot of economic downturn in Africa because of COVID-19 and when you don't have food for people because all the crops have been eaten, that's the main subsistence crops in Africa that will have been eaten by locusts. That, that will be pretty terrible. So it will be a humanitarian disaster and for those businesses that are dependent on Africa for their supply chains an economic disaster. So that's an example of something that's definitely going to be happening and that's going to be a very serious issues you know, six months from now, six to 12 months from now, when the crops that should have been ripened and harvested will not be there. Excellent. Um, next question is, have you offered your services to the White House? <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I work with businesses. I really don't like getting into politics because that's that's sort of a, sort of a, a dangerous field. As, you know, when my book is published, I'll be happy to send them a free copy. Let's say it that way. Uh, thank you. Uh, next question is, uh, what do you think will be future, will, will be the future of people like us, those who are in offering of risk management services and insurance to B2B clients? I am planning to expand my insurance marketing business aggressively. Uh, is, uh, is it a good time? This is a good time to think about your insurance as to become a thought leader and becoming a thought leader on the kind of ways that people want to be thinking about the pandemic in the long run. This is all, everything that people are thinking about. So the way that you can tie, first of all, your insurance marketing to the pandemic is going to be important, but as you want to become a credible thought leader. So producing content about the pandemic and how your insurance can help address the pandemic would be really helpful because people are really thinking about, they're trying to cut costs right now and they're thinking that the pandemic will be a short-term thing if you can demonstrate that hey already right now you are clearly demonstrating that the pandemic is going to be a long-term thing and you're creating thought leadership content around that and you are having insurance offerings around addressing the long-term impact of the pandemic that's something that's going to cause people to wake up and take notice in a couple of months as they realize the pandemic will not fade in the summer. So many people are still thinking that kind of a pretty absurd uh, idea. We, we have a number of studies that show a number of actually areas where that are hot right now where the pandemic is, where COVID-19 is expanding pretty quickly, not as quickly as in climates that are colder, but still quickly enough. So the pandemic will not disappear by the summer. And if you can show that by the summer you have developed some thought content, leadership content, marketing content that's going to be really relevant to this. I think that will help your the expand the insurance business quite effectively. Uh, the next question, um, is it possible that COVID-19 was around prior to December? We were in Europe uh, at the end of December or at the end of October, beginning of November, and mm -hmm. uh, my husband was very sick. He's never been uh, so sick, and he ended up with breathing issues, pneumonia. Is it possible it was around, that it was around prior? Of course. So we know that in certain areas of Europe, especially Italy, Italy has a northern Italy, the area that was hardest hit by the pandemic, has a very strong connection to Wuhan, the city in China that was strongest hit by the pandemic. By the way, this is a huge city. It's 11 million people. It's the internal industrial hub of China. It's kind of, it's it's been called the Chicago of China, and it has it's a very big city. So it's you know people have not been paying nearly enough attention to how important and big of a city it is in China, and that it was all shut down. So that's one issue, but. 
people from Wuhan have been traveling to northern Italy extensively for a long time. And we don't know how long it has been around in Wuhan, it's probably since November at least. So in, Bu in Wuhan had, has 500 flights per day, international flights per day. And if you assume something like 250 people per flight on average, that's 10,000 people a day going out of Wuhan. So yes, so some of them might well have been inf infected and have brought it to Europe and so on, it, especially, especially if you've been around northern Italy, but elsewhere in Europe as well, where people from Wuhan might have traveled. Yes, definitely could have been the case. Excellent. Our next, next question, um, is there any advice for nursing homes? So for nursing homes, what you want to be thinking about is social distancing. Of course, this is a huge thing. Following all the CDC guidelines. If you're not able to follow all the CDC guidelines, which a number of nursing homes honestly are not because of the strictness of the guidelines, I'd strongly recommend seeing if some, if some of the families can take their patients home because you don't want to be known as the nursing home that had an outbreak and had various issues happen there. So this is something that you want to be thinking about. If you're not able communicating honestly with the families of the patients, telling them that, hey, you know, it, it feels uncomfortable. It feels kind of you know uncomfortable to reveal this information, but telling them that, hey, we're not able to get the PPE that's needed for us to be really safe. We're not able to have the social distancing. So if you don't want you know, grandma in this sort of environment, I recommend that you temporarily take her home and we'll of course give you a refund for you know, taking grandma home for until we're able to ensure the safety of everyone. And this is a serious issue that I strongly recommend that nursing homes take that step in order to be prepared and in order to avoid legal liability, which I can guarantee to you is coming down the road for a lot of nursing homes that have not taken these sorts of steps. Excellent. Our next question, um, how do you see this impacting the transport industry, for example, aviation and airports? Badly. So uh, the airport airplanes will be much more hit than they think they will because again a lot of people are hoping that it will be around you know only for the next few months but it will not be so airplane and the government will not be you know it, it gave that one time 50 billion grand slash loan to airplanes to the airplane industry i don't think any more money is forthcoming from the government for the airplane industry in particular so maybe potentially it can take advantage of other loans uh, but th there's serious issues in the airplane industry. They will have many less clients, many less people flying. What I'm suspecting will happen is going to be some mergers where the weaker ones will be swallowed up by the larger ones, by the stronger ones, and those might get some kind of government support. But this is something that's not going to be an industry that's going to take it well. This is one of those industries, just like the train industry, bus industry, people will not want to, to be traveling right now. A lot of people who previously have been traveling by airplanes, when they need to travel, they'll prefer to take a day long uh, car trip where they can stay socially isolated rather than risk going on an airplane. A lot of people are scared, a lot of people are worried, and that's going to impact the airplane industry past, I'm honestly past the vaccines because some people will not believe that vaccines are effective and some people will not want to get vaccines because of anti-vaxxer sentiments. And uh, so you will need to plan for 2025, 2026 in order to provide a cushion of safety for the airplane industry for when vaccines will be out. And before that, lots of people will not be taking airplanes. Next question. Uh, what are some downstream dependencies for the pandemic that we should be mind mindful of that could be catastrophic to government organizations? The last one, test drives for government organizations. Can you please repeat that, Kay? Yes, of course. I'll, re I'll repeat the entire question. Uh, yes. What are some downstream dependencies for the pandemic that we should be mindful of that could be catastrophic to government ah, organizations? Catastrophic. Well, one of the things is just the politics of the issue. Right now, you'll see a lot of, and I'm not commenting on whether it's good or bad, but you'll see that a lot of Republicans, specifically in the Senate. So this is a situation, I'm not saying whether it's good or bad, I'm not taking a political side, but I'm just analyzing the situation. This is something that I do. So looking at the situation right now, it seems that both Trump and the Democrats, the president and the Democrats in Congress want to fund, give funding to states and cities and municipalities and so on. The Republicans, at least in the Senate, 
seem to be strongly opposed. So this might be a dynamic that depending on how things shake out, that money will not be forthcoming to, uh, to municipalities, to states and so on. And that will be, of course, catastrophic because so much of a, the state and city budget has been devastated by the pandemic. And as a result, there'll be a lot of need for budget cuts, which might well happen. And so this is something a lot of states, a lot of cities are not taking this nearly as seriously as they, they, they are also following the advice of Goldman Sachs and other, you know, Elon Musk and so on, many others who are thinking that, hey, it'll be over by, you know, by in a couple of months. They don't realize the long-term impact of this and they're not planning for that long-term impact. They think that this, there'll be a V-shaped recovery. They, there won't be. The recovery will be at best U-shaped and it will take a while until the vaccine is available. We will not have any serious recovery until the vaccine is available. And so you want to be thinking about 2024, 2025 with serious distressed level of economic activity, with loosenings and loosening and tightening of restrictions. Of course, medical you know, establishments to the extent that they're dependent on local municipalities will will require more money. So those are uh, some things that you want to be thinking about. Ideally, you want to send your workers to work from home as much as possible. So having virtual work as much as possible, that's something you want to be thinking about. I strongly want to encourage you to think about cybersecurity. A number of states have, a number of municipalities have been hacked very badly and had cybersecurity breaches. There will be many more of these going forward because people are not who are working from home in different environments. They're not used to thinking about cybersecurity as the, they are in the office. So that's something you want to be investing into professional development for that. Other areas are the things that I mentioned earlier, the external business model and the internal business model. Thinking about how you can deliver municipal services virtually will be very helpful. City services virtually will be very helpful to the extent that you can. And then think about the kind of needs that people will have. I mean, it's, it's really hard for heartbreaking for me to be to see the, you know, people on the streets, poor people who are not able to get the shelter, the homeless shelter services that they previously needed. It's, also heartbreaking for me to look at the future, you know, six months ahead and see all the healthcare workers, police, uh, firefighters and so on, first responders whose jobs will be eliminated because the city state budgets will be cut and they can't not be cut unless the federal government steps up. And again, there's high probability that it won't. So there's a lot of these sorts of concerns that you want to be thinking about. And uh, you can email me prior. So again, if you fill out the form, if I'll send you the resources and then we can have an exchange about any of these questions and that, that one in particular and as well as, of course, any others I can talk about in much more depth. Please go ahead. The next question is, I work for a school division. We mm -hmm. take our direction from the health departments. How do you see classroom learning for K through 12 schools moving forward from a moderate view? From moderate view, I'd say that Right now, what will likely happen will be a number of classes will do hybrid, where schools will do hybrid, where there will be a shifts of students, maybe some in the morning, some in the evening to allow for social distancing. That it's not the best strategy. And of course, some more online learning, ideally, to the extent that you have control to influence on this is to be able to move to all virtual learning with some in-class activities like lab that can't be done virtually. Also, there have been a number of good lab virtual developments, so we can do labs virtually. And maybe some in-school events that need to really be done uh, that are going to be difficult to do otherwise. But ideally, it, to the extent that you have control to move it as much of it virtual as possible, and it's not as good. I mean, I know that I'm an educator, but this is something, you know, I, I was in the higher academia for 15 years, including seven years as a professor at Ohio State and before that I taught as a fellow. So I know that education in uh, that context is not nearly as good when it's not face to face, but you can't... Uh, for to rely on face-to-face -face education in this context until there is a vaccine. So thinking in that moderate scenario, that five-year span, think about that plan and how you would handle education, ideally moving as much of it virtual as possible and whatever you can't move virtual, having it social distancing, 
at 10 feet ideally the six feet is a super minimal number the research when you look at the research they say six feet minimal 10 feet ideal so you want to do 10 feet to the extent that you can extensive sanitation of course and all of that dr glove can you take one last question happy to okay kai so of course um so the next question um, have you seen studies regarding the long-term impact of isolation or work at home on the health of people outside of the COVID exposures? If mm -hmm. the economy collapses, how many people will be harmed by this? So two things, so two parts of the question. The long-term effects of working at home, there's going to be more isolation, so more mental health struggles. That's going to be one thing. If it's not working from home, but the thing that you want to be thinking about separately is lack of access to gyms, outdoor exercises, so you'll have physical fitness struggles. So those are things that you can replace. And those are things I strongly, when I talk, I mean, I do some executive coaching and I talk to executives, I talk to them about their personal life as well. I strongly encourage them to look for ways to replace the previous ways that they interacted with others socially with online experience. So that doesn't mean only Zoom parties. Uh, something that you know I'm personally doing and that I'm encouraging people to do is doing online games, apps. I'm playing Scrabble with uh, colleagues and friends with whom I used to interact and you know, play tennis together. And then I'm doing exercising exercise at home for physical fitness. And so you want to be able to replace, and these are just some examples. So you want to be able to replace with virtual connections, things that you previously used to do face to face. So those are the kinds of things you want to be thinking about. Mental health is going to take a, is going to be seriously impacted. Physical health is going to be impacted. And you want to think about right now, how for that moderate scenario for the five years, you are going to take care of your mental health and your physical health, and you're going to help others for whom you're a trusted advisor and just your family members and friends take care of their mental health and their physical health, take care of el the older people in your life who are over 60, so not old people, but older people, because they are especially vulnerable to COVID-19, so caretaking for them. So that's kind of one example, one side of it. And the other side of it is the economic. It's going to be pretty terrible. So the best chance, the best bet we have right now in order to avoid an economic collapse is to have suppression right now and then contact tracing and isolation going forward with regional suppressions uh, if there's a serious outbreak in an area that wave of loosening restrictions loosening restrictions that i talked about that's the best thing we can do because if you have outbreaks in more areas if you have more people traveling to more areas and you have more COVID 19 spreading then you'll have m more trouble getting control of it going forward and you'll have much more devastating economic impacts rolling onward so we can't fall into hyperbolic discounting we can't let you know tomorrow's you know we can't lose we can't let losing a dollar tomorrow cost us losing ten dollars a week from now cost us losing a hundred dollars a month from now costing us losing a thousand dollars a year from now you know all of those are orders of magnitude difference and we need to understand that by losing a smaller amount right now, we are gaining much more going forward. We're preventing ourselves, protecting ourselves from that loss. So we can't fall into hyperbolic discounting. And what we need to do as a society is to up the amount of testing so that we can do contact trace, so that we can do testing, isolation of cases after they've been brought down in certain areas and then contact tracing of these people. And so with that dynamic, we can minimize the economic costs. Because if we just open up the economy right now, I can guarantee to you the economic costs will be much, 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 much more devastating down the road because you know, people will not accept New York-like situations, levels of hospital overload, and they will, we will have to close our cities, we'll have to close our states at a much higher extent and longer if we don't do shorter closing down right now for the then contact tracing and isolation. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Saporsky. I'd like to thank you again for your time and expertise. A copy of this webinar will be archived on Opus Ed and Risk Knowledge within a few days, probably Monday of next week. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Be sure to check out tinyurl.com slash DAE dash event for more information. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.